This video discusses the European Union and its political system. Now, the European Union is, of course, not a country. It's not even a, a confederation, though it has, uh, over time, moved towards confederation. And exactly when it will become a confederation or, or how it could become a confederation, that's up for debate, really. It has a political system uh, that is much more complex than any other form of regional integration today. So uh, I'm going to discuss this uh, at, at some length. First, let's talk about some principles of, of governance. Basic principles for the EU is that it needs to balance the interests of the member states with pan-European interests. What's good for the continent as a whole versus what's good for an individual member state. And when uh, a member joins, most recently Croatia uh, in, in July of 2013, uh, the member cedes some sovereignty to the EU. So that uh, country uh, has slightly less sovereignty than uh, it had before accession. If we view it as a simple plus minus uh, equation, which is it isn't. Because uh, upon ceding some of that sovereignty uh, to the EU, it actually gains influence over the other members at the same time. So they're sitting around the table together in these institutions of governance. They can uh, then create coalitions with other member states on common ground, common issues, and thus impact the agenda. And uh, of course, uh, when a decision has been made, um, uh, the, the member states have to, to effectively comply with it in, in many policy fields. So there is a trade-off here. All are bound by the same rules and all can influence each other. Uh, so even though at, at first glance there is this um, seeming loss of sovereignty upon joining, there is actually also at the same time gaining influence over the other members. I also want to mention the Treaty of Lisbon, which is the latest one. It uh, moves uh, decision-making rules for the Council of the EU, and we'll get to that in a moment, from unanimity to qualified majority on several policy areas that used to, to require unanimity. And that makes for a good deal more effective governance. And when you have 28 uh, people around the table, 28 ministers around the table, um, it, it goes without saying that unanimity would make it very difficult to, to um, uh, make decisions uh, and, and act uh, in, in those policy areas. Uh, it also introduced the president of the European Council and a European representative in foreign affairs, which uh, effectively uh, means that the, the EU is taking on more and more of these confederalist um, uh, traits. And it also made the un uh, Union's Charter of Rights binding for all member states. Now let's have a look at the system. Now let's have a look at the system. So uh, first of all, there are a couple of checks and balances here. The Courts of Justice that oversees the fair in interpretation of EU law in all states. And it has had quite a bit of, it's kind of like the, the European Union Supri Supreme Court. Uh, even though it, it doesn't have uh, the same powers that the American Supreme Court would have, uh, it has made a series of land make, uh, landmark decisions that has asserted its significance for free movement and trade in these particular areas uh, for the European Union. Uh, because if you want an internal market and you want that internal market to function, um, then uh, you have to have an arbiter, and that's the Court of Justice. And this, it, it really overrules uh, member states in that sense. A second check and balance here is the European Central Bank, created in the Maastricht Treaty, uh, which sets interest rates for the, the Eurozone, effectively, very much modeled on the German Bundesbank. Uh, and it might very well become the most uh, powerful body since 1957. So this is what the system looks like. Um, Here's the people, and these are the bodies, uh, and uh, it looks kind of like a parliamentary system. Like a parliamentary system and like many democracies, it has a bicameral legislature, but unlike most legislatures, um, the lower house, which is the European Parliament, is actually the less powerful body in the legislature. The upper house is the Council of the EU, and that's where the, the, the real power lies. The people uh, elect directly representatives to the parliament. Uh, the Council of the EU 
is the body that represents the member state governments. So in that sense, it's kind of equivalent to the American Senate, where states are represented, or the German uh, Bundesrat, where the Länder are represented. Uh, and this would be an equivalent to the House of Representatives in the US or the German Bundestag. So that's how, and of course the European Commission is also, the, the commissioners are sent from the member, member states. So these member states have uh, the, these double appointment uh, capacities. Now the legislature then, uh, as I mentioned, the European Parliament uh, is directly elected and it has legislative power and it makes, uh, so it's re responsible for the democratic supervision of, of all EU institutions and it makes co-decisions with the council uh, on a number of, of issues uh, and has to approve uh, nominees for uh, commission. Uh, just a quick look inside parliament, it kind of looks like this, where uh, all these member people come from all these different member countries uh, and each member state has a number of seats according to uh, the population size. And when they get there, they join a party group. So you will have all the liberals in the same party group. So there will be Germans and um, French and British and Spanish liberals sitting together. So they're organized in party groups by ideology. Uh, not by which country they come from. So you'll have socialists from all over Europe and conservatives and, and so on and so forth. Moving on, moving on uh, in the council uh, instead, uh, which is the really the main decision-making body in the EU, that this is where the ministers from the member states uh, gather. So that's what makes up the council. Uh, when the health issues are discussed, the health ministers meet. Uh, when it's a top summit, it's the head of governments that meet and so on. And they share uh, powers with, with the parliament and so on. And, and, and votes here are differentiated based on the population of the member states. So the biggest, uh, member states will have more votes than the small ones, so Germany 29, Malta 3 in this table, uh, but note that it's also graded so that per capita the smaller states have more influence, uh, and so that uh, a Maltese citizen actually has more input in what happens at the co you know, Council of the EU than a German citizen does. And it's also rigged so that the large countries can't simply just uh, run all over the smaller countries. Uh, they have to build coalitions in different ways. The commission is the executive. Uh, this is uh, kind of like the EU cabinet, a permanent executive of, of the EU. It proposes legislation and in initiates and implements most programs and upholds the treaties and does all that everyday administration of the EU. Uh, the commissioners come are nominated by national governments and approved by uh, the council. And um, there are 28 commissioners, one per member state. And each commissioner will have a uh, director, uh, directorate general uh, there's one, at least one per, per commissioner. And this is where the, the administration and civil service of the EU comes in. Now the EU has, has produced a whole lot of public policy, uh, of course, and uh, let's finish up with that. First of all, of course, the internal market, uh, really important, uh, the freedom of movement within the EU of people and goods and services and money. Um, a, a member, a citizen of the European Union, uh, if you live in Portugal, you can go to Germany, you can buy your car there and drive all the way back through all those customs and all those borders. Uh, without ever being stopped by a customs agent, because uh, effectively there are no borders between, uh, there, there are no border checkpoints, I should say, uh, between these countries. So that's freedom of movement for 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 um, uh, goods and services. No tariffs or trade barriers between the members of the internal market. Um, it, it also means that member states have less control over what is made. Uh, and sold in their borders and what crosses their, what items are actually crossing their borders. Um, but again, that goes for everyone. Uh, a, a second really important public policy item here has been the common agricultural policy, which is the, the single biggest budget post of the EU, uh, really large subsidies to farmers and high tariffs against non-EU produce. 
this is a controversial policy. It hasn't really been extended uh, immediately to the newest members because of the controversy involved, uh, but um, uh, and it's also been heavily critiqued. Uh, but it's also being defended uh, by the older members that, of course, benefit greatly from the subsidies. But of course, the biggest talking point right now has to do with the euro. The common currency, uh, only 17 of the 28, sorry, that should be say 28, use the euro at this time. Some have not qualified economically to join. Others have chosen not to. So for instance, Sweden and the United Kingdom could have joined the euro, but decided not to. And uh, it's really about how uh, is sovereignty affected when member states can't regulate their own interest rates. Uh, some people are saying that the current crisis uh, in the eurozone with national debts and so on is because of too f too little oversight by the European Commission on national budgets. So the solution would then be to give the European Commission more oversight over national budgets. But of course, that's going to be very, very controversial given the issue of sovereignty. Uh, and, and some people are, are in, in Greece, if nowhere else, have asked about if, if Greece is still a sovereign state, given all the, the um, strings attached to the bailout loans that the EU have provided. On the other hand, uh, German taxpayers are not particularly uh, are probably not going to be particularly pleased with the thought of, of giving loans to a government that they would see as, as uh, ineffective and, and without any assurance that uh, the, the state budget won't, uh, won't be cleaned up properly. Uh, so this is uh, the kinds of disputes going on around um, uh, the, the Eurozone and the Eurozone crisis. So that's an overview of the European Union political system. I hope you found it useful.